Thanks, guys. Thank you. Good morning. So I'm really excited here uh, to kind of talk about this because as people that know me know I'm really passionate about, about high fidelity and high resolution. That's really, really important to me. And I think it's really important that all of us as filmmakers of different degrees need to make sure that we are putting the best foot forward. When you think about what our job is, if we have an obligation of a job, it is to produce the best pictures we possibly can. That's really our job, right? Like, if you know there's a better way to do it, then that's kind of now, unfortunately, your problem. Because if, if you, as soon as you find out there's a better way, now you have an obligation to do that. Similar, if you think about, like, I always use analogies with, with car manufacturers because they make a really, really good analogies. As soon as there's a way to make a car safer, everyone expects it to be safer, right? And we can't go back, we can only go forward. And I think as we walked around the floor, you see so much 4K content, so many 4K monitors, and so many 4K opportunities. We need to make sure that we can make Alexa work in a 4K moving world. And so I call this kind of maximizing 3K for the big screen. Um, my company does a lot of high fidelity pictures. We try to do 4K as much as we possibly can. And we are a finishing house, so we do a lot of color correction and conform and all those things. But I also spend a lot of time on set doing all the capture and initial color correction. And I'm very excited about things like where Adobe Premiere, Final Cut 10, and the Resolve Edit Tool, which can edit in 4K. And I believe there's a very near future where 4K and 3K editing is going to be a big deal. But what I wanted to talk about first is where 4K is going to be. A lot of people think that 4K is going to come to us in the form of cinema, that cinema is going to be the big group to deliver us 4K. Unfortunately, I don't think that's going to be true because there's so many things in cinema that are, in terms of infrastructure, that are in the way. Cinema is actually going to be slower to do 4K delivery, unfortunately. It's, it's not a good thing, but that's kind of the way it's going to be. In fact, broadband is actually going to be more common places in which 4K is going to be visible and people are going to be experienced. Broadcast as well, but mostly broadband. So I'm really excited about that, which means if you're working in movies, there's a need to move your pictures to a higher quality. But if you're not working in movies, there's actually an even greater need to move your pictures to higher quality. And if you've seen, if you looked around the floor, there's more 4K consumer exhibition devices at this show than there are professional 4K exhibition de devices. So that's a really good thing uh, moving forward. Just to kind of prove that point, here's a couple statistics in an article I wrote for ICG this month, which I called the Broadband Travel Guide. You see, where we're headed in the broadband world with 4K is that so many people are getting their content online that they're expecting higher quality pictures and they're going to be watching so much more content on the web than they are on broadcast and over cinema. So there's a really good reasons uh, to push these pictures further because I'm not just saying we need to move better quality pictures just for the sake of it. We have the obligation to do it because there is going to be ways in which to see 4K and it's finally really happening after all these years. So I want you to think about this concept. This is the next subject I want to talk about. 80% of cinema today is shot in 3K or above. If you're shooting a digital cinema movie, 80% of the movies shot are going to be above 2K resolution. But 99% of what you see in the theaters is in 2K. So we have covered our bases in one area. We've, we've successfully deployed high resolution capture almost everywhere. And that's really great compared to five, six, seven years ago where shooting above 1080p was still pretty rare. Today, shooting 1080p is rare. That's good for movies. But seeing 2K and 1080p in the theaters is not rare. And that's a problem. And so I want to ask myself, why on earth is 99% of cinema actually finished in 2K? And there are actually three reasons. And if you take for a second, you can probably think of those a bunch of reasons. Ask yourself, why is cinema finished in 2K? And I'll tell you the three biggest reasons. Three biggest reasons, number one is visual effects. It's very difficult to move 4K files through visual effects pipeline. I have some ideas on how to improve that. The simplest way is to just do some scaling, and scaling with visual effects can actually be a, a good medium. 
Um, but there's also a lack of post infrastructure. A lot of infrastructures, maybe it's your own, your own post house or the post house you work with or your own infrastructure is actually not designed for higher than 2K finishing. That's another thing. And then on miseducation or uneducation, people just haven't been educated. Here's one of the worst things that I find um, it really happens with cinematographers a lot of time because cinematographers love to test. They don't just grab a camera and shoot. They always get in and get in and, and test it before they shoot. Even the same camera is a good idea to test. But what happens with cinematographers is they're often testing 4K cameras, 3K cameras, and 2K cameras and HD cameras, but they're evaluating their tests in HD. Right? Because these cameras output right to a nice HD monitor. And I will be very clear that the quality of a 4K or 3K output and the quality of a 1080 output to the same HD monitor is going to look very, very similar, even though those pictures are ultimately very, very different. That would be under sort of the misinformation or miseducation of certain technology. So we have reasons why cinema seems to say 2K is good enough. But it's not good enough, and there are ways in which we can move forward. Here are some of the solutions I have for that in visual effects scaling or adaptive motion blur, which I call AMB, which is basically adjusting the resolution based on how much blur is in the screen. You realize if you're shooting Alexa 3K and it's out of focus, it's not 3K anymore, right? So, you know, when things blur, when the camera's panning really fast, effects don't need to be as re high res. Um, post infrastructure, encourage the post houses you work with to upgrade. It it's, it's, can be uncomfortable, but it's necessary to discuss important, uh, important upgrades. And then education, we need to push all the groups that are training people to make sure that uh, cinematographers specifically are able to evaluate 4K in 4K. You cannot evaluate 4K in HD. I know that sounds obvious, but a lot of people do it. So you've got to look at it in 4K because it does change the experience. So. How can we maximize Alexa in a 4K environment? I mentioned that we've got a broadband world that's growing, so that's UHD. We've got 4K cinema that's trying to get its gears going, and it's going to take a little longer than, UH, than uh, broadband, but it's happening. So how can we do that? You've got to expand your megapixels. And here are some statistics with Alexa that's going to help this explain that. When you shoot Alexa ProRes 1080p, which is the most popular format that the Alexa camera shoots, you're getting about two megapixels of resolution. Okay, So you got two megapixels of resolution. When Aerie released uh, at the end of last year the new ProRes 2K option, 17% 17, 17 resolution increase, which is actually noticeable. On a big screen, 17% is going to make a big enough difference that that's absolutely worth moving to the 2K ProRes option. So this is great for even movies of the week. If you're doing movie of the week or television, by shooting the 2K ProRes, you can still scale that down. It's 17% more source resolution, which is good for visual effects. It's good for tightening up that picture. It can even be good for repositioning. So I recommend everybody take a good look at 2048, even if you're delivering in HD today. But then Alexa also released, uh, Aerie also released the 4x3 sensor. And the 4x3 sensor pushes the resolution a huge number. Still maintaining ProRes, you're actually getting a 36% overall increase in resolution by shooting in the ProRes 2K anamorphic mode. That's a huge percentage more um, in turn, three megapixels versus two megapixels. So even if you're finishing in 1080, this is producing 30, about 36% more resolution to put in your picture. And then, of course, we have Airy Raw. Airy Raw is a 44% increase in resolution. The problem is most people haven't looked at Airy Raw in true 3K. They scale it down to 1080, compare it to the ProRes 1080, and they look very similar. But you're really getting four and a half megapixels of captured data, which is a massive improvement over the original ProRes 1080. This is the camera that I'm in love with, the 4.6 and above megapixel. But there's one more mode that Alexa offers, and that is the anamorphic Airy Raw mode. Almost 70% more resolution than 1080p. So in the same camera, we have uh, six megapixels of resolution that allows you to get in the very, what we would consider high fidelity category. This is not an HD camera when you're talking six megapixels or above. So this is where we've got to head uh, going forward. So 
Where I think this is really poignant is I believe that as broadband is going to expand the opportunities for distribution, you realize that, I mean, many of us in this crowd right here are from different countries, different cities, different places, and all of us have different specs for broadcast deliveries. We, some of us have 4x3, 16x9, some people have to shoot for both 4x3 and 16x9. I know you're probably always faced with having to pretend to do both somehow. Uh, F Screw it, yeah, you could say that, you know, some people have to deal with um, uh, shooting, they want to basically do uh, like PAL versions, they have different resolutions, slightly different versions, interlays, progressive, well, the internet basically doesn't have any specific formats, right? The internet doesn't care if it's wider or taller. The internet doesn't really care if it's 24 frames per second or 21 frames per second. It will play it back. The internet doesn't care if the black point's at zero or one or two or three or four. It doesn't really matter. So when we go to broadband, I think as people want to create a more immersive experience, a lot of the ways we can achieve that is through wider pictures. And Aerie's been pushing, maybe ironically, you know, as they've been building a 4.3 sensor, they've got the new set of 4K master primes that are anamorphic. What I think this means is in the broadband world, you can start shooting television shows that are gonna be on the internet that can be any aspect ratio you want, especially widescreen. Today, television in the United States still does not have a 235 Academy Aperture television show. But if you look really closely on American television, you are starting to see 235 commercials. And the commercial market is starting to look a lot more cinematic because they're going widescreen. But then when you watch a TV show, it opens back up again. What the Blu-ray home experience and ultra high definition home experience is gonna deliver is gonna be wider. And so we wanna actually see scope picture television shows. And now we can actually do that in ultra high resolution. So, Here's the problem with a 2K DI world. We said 70% more resolution. If you're doing a widescreen project for either television, UHD, or cinema, if you're doing a standard, you're taking 2048 pixels by 1152. That's 2.4 megapixels. That's your full aperture plate. What happens is you have to crop that down. And all of us have been doing this for a long time, have probably had a job in the past where we've had to crop, right? We've, we've been in that market. When you crop, you're getting 2048 by 858, 1.7 megapixels. This is not much more vertical resolution than 720p. And 720p is 15 years old. So we are not really in vertical resolution that much further away than we were shooting 720p 15 years ago. This is not a good considered high fidelity picture. And on a big screen, 858 lines of resolution is not going to hold up for a scope picture very well. So the cropping's got to go. So if you actually work in your DI at native resolution with the airy raw material, you actually work with 6.2 megapixels, but it's squeezed. This actually, for those of you that remember film, this is kind of how we did film. When you shot anamorphic, the film itself was stretched, and you work with it stretched, and we used optics to de-stretch it, which means even when they got down to printing the film for distribution, the film was still anamorphic, so it was extremely high resolution. That's the application of how this should work. What a lot of people think when they shoot on digital cameras, I think they think, the anamorphic is an acquisition, but then when we're working with it, we're going to stretch it out and we're going to decompress it. Wrong. When you're, you need to treat this like film in this sense, and you need to stay anamorphic the whole time and keep every pixel that the camera actually captures. When you do that, with Alexa, because you get a 133 sensor, when you stretch that out, you get a 266 picture, which is actually a little wider than what uh, Academy aspect ratio is. Most people would do a 2.4 output. This is a 2.6 output, so it's a little bit wider, but we're over six megapixels in total resolution, which is a huge number to look at. So, if you look at these comparisons, the same picture for an anamorphic project, if you do it with the anamorphic DI, you're at six megapixels. If you do it with the standard 2K DI, you're at 1.7 megapixels. Nobody can convince me that you cannot see that difference on a large screen. You will all see that difference. In fact, if you are to master your project at six megapixels and even scale that down 
to HD or to web or to something like that, you're still going to have a better picture because you did the whole thing in 6, K, uh, 6, uh, uh, 6 megapixels, which is exactly what we used to do with film. We didn't shoot film in 35 and transfer to 16 when we were done. That's what you're doing. If you're shooting uh, high fidelity pictures now and you're down converting them to 2K, it's like printing on 16. It doesn't look terrible, but it does not look as good as it could. So here's a good way to measure that. If any of this isn't making sense, this should, this should help make sense. If I were to take a 4K DCP, the, the reason we have to go to 4K is the delivery package for, um, so for cinema is in, we have an HD or 2K delivery package and we have a 4K delivery package. Those are our options. So check out where this works. If you shoot 1920, you're at one and a half megapixels. If you do 4096, you're at seven megapixels. This is for anamorphic delivery, okay? If you go to 2K, you're at 1.7 megapixels. So there's a little bit improvement over HD, um, but it's not a massive improvement. But look at where anamorphic Airy Raw fits. It's closer to a 4K delivery package than it is to a 2K delivery package, a lot closer. And so five and a half megapixels in a cinema uh, package format is almost 4K in this regard. Because Airy RAW files are uncompressed and because the Alexa has a very quiet sensor, this stuff looks fantastic even though it's only 5.6 megapixels as opposed to seven. It's really going to deliver a whole better picture than you would in 2K. So I'm gonna show you a little case study here. I'm gonna show you a trailer for a movie that's coming out called John Wick. This is one of the early uh, anamorphic, airy raw, four by three uh, feature films. This is shot by an amazing DP, Jonathan Sella, who does actually incredible work. And you'll, you'll notice all the anamorphic properties. Jonathan really moves the camera in places where the anamorphic gets shown off in a lot of ways. Uh, these were on Hawk anamorphics as well. Uh, but the most important thing to understand about what you're going to see here is this is a 3K DI all the way through. So you're, you're really experiencing 3K pushed to 4K through a full anamorphic DI. And when you see the black bars to create the 240 aperture, you'll realize here these black bars are not crop marks. All the resolution in this picture is inside the top and bottom black bars. That's where we're getting the resolution. So we'll take a look at this now. So that's where anamorphic can really start to let us go. And anamorphic is with uncompressed uh, 3K anamorphic DI. That's really something everyone should be really pushing for in terms of getting the most out of their Alexa content. But there's one last element to this that I know is probably stirring in some people's minds. And so this is a little out of the box, but the issue is how do we deal with this because not everybody can afford to work with Airy Raw? That might be one of the concerns people have is the cost of storage of backup because if you present the cinematographer with the option to do 3K and then there's an increase in budget over 1080, sometimes they won't be allowed to take advantage of that option. Does that sound familiar maybe? It's unfortunate, but it's the case. So here's how we have a workaround, a really what I call a golden nugget for being able to prepare so that you actually have a 4K workflow with Alexa, but you can manage the Airy Raw content in a different way. So the first thing you're gonna need is an XT. The XT camera allows you to capture the same files that you captured ProRes to the cards can also capture Airy Raw. So you don't have to have an external or separate recording system. So you start with the XT, which captures ProRes and Airy Raw on the same card. So you capture the Airy Raw. The second thing you do is you do have to download the ARI negative. The ARI negative is about 630 gigabytes an hour. So it's pretty beefy compared to the 120 gigabytes an hour ProRes 1080p. But here's where the workflow changes. Instead of processing your Airy Raw files, what we do is we encourage you to transcode them instantly to ProRes. So you actually create a 3K ProRes file and you no longer keep the original Airy Raw file. So what you're doing is you're making like a dupe negative, right? You're making like a, 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 an inter negative that is now your new negative. 
And that way you have your Airy Raw saved on your onset download system, but it's only meant to be there temporarily. Does that make sense? It's only there temporarily, and you're transcoding that to a 3K ProRes file, and now you have a log C ProRes workflow. And so if you look at that, it's just like the ProRes workflow that we're all experienced with and are familiar with in the log C 1080 ProRes version of Alexa but you get the resolution of 6.2 megapixels in a ProRes container. That's 50% smaller than the Airy RAW files, which puts it about the same size as other cameras in terms of downloading. So you're not actually archiving or saving these files and they're much larger than you would if you would shoot with other cameras that are out on the market. So this is a great way to do a hybrid workflow because the Alexa does not give us a true 4K end-to-end -end solution right now. But we have to start thinking about how to get closer to 4K and this is how we can do it. We can be creative. And one of the things I think is a, is a great quote from Kevin Spacey, um, he was talking about if there's one thing that overlaps between business and art, it's that risk takers are rewarded. This is a little unorthodox. I understand what I'm describing is a little bit different from what a normal workflow would be. But these are the types of things you have to come up with in order to create a higher quality picture and make appropriate compromises that are gonna be possible to work in the future. And I guarantee you, when you see Airy 3K files, especially in a widescreen format, and especially as you see that more and more on the web, you're gonna be happy that you've been able to think out of the box to be able to make it financially work and for the creative side to be happy with the pictures that they create.